Well, it's great to be with you all this morning. Pastor Ian gave me a great topic. We're going to talk about suffering today. <laughs> uh, we actually are. We're starting this, this series on suffering. And um, my part of this this morning is to kind of lay an introductory foundation. I want to talk to you about a loving God in a suffering world. And I want to say to you up front that Suffering is way too sacred and way too sorrowful for us to treat it and just some kind of flippant cheerleader, come on, you're going to be all right kind of way. Uh-uh. No, as we unpack this series, we're going to deal with very real aspects of suffering from Doubt and questioning and confusion, maybe even offense and bitterness. The whole gamut. Going to dig into all of it. Today um, is going to be at a certain point a bit philosophical. As much as it is scriptural, it's going to be philosophical. And so I need you to put your thinking caps on as well today. Um, because these are thoughts about suffering that many times we don't think about and we need to if we're going to have a strong foundation um, during times of suffering. If you're sitting there today and you go, um, Steve, I'm not sure that I've ever really suffered. <laughs> the good news is you're going to. In one way or another, before you check out of this life, you are going to suffer. And it's a promise. We don't, we don't make refrigerator magnets or Hallmark cards or bumper stickers or t-shirts out of it, but it's a promise from God. All those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Yeah, suffering isn't just physical persecution, the threatening of your life, although it can involve that for sure. There's emotional, spiritual suffering, oppression, depression. There's all different forms of suffering. And you are not going to get out of this world as a follower of Jesus without facing suffering. I've heard too many times, you know, 31 years of pastoring, you can preach and teach on suffering and you will have people say yes and amen about suffering. And then when something comes their way, that causes them to suffer, I've heard far too many times, why me? And I want to say with massive amounts of compassion, why not you? Why not you? What makes you think that you are exempt from suffering, but just the rest of us get to suffer? We're all going to suffer. Settle it. And then beyond settle it, start building your life right now in such a way that when you suffer, you are going to be able to suffer successfully. And suffering successfully doesn't mean that you won't have doubts or questions or fears or offense or bitterness at some point. Suffering successfully just means you're never going to lose your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to get you through to the other side. That's what suffering successfully is about. So... Anyway, I've got a bunch for you this morning. I'm going to try to make it as concise as possible, but get ready to drink out of a fire hose this morning, okay? Suffering, without question, just diving right in here, without question, can absolutely rock you to the core of your own faith. It doesn't have to, but it can, as we'll see today. The good news is, God, listen to me, God is willing and able to handle your questions, your objections, your fears. He will answer it with his, listen, his loving presence and his powerful truth. Listen, his presence and his truth. I want to shake you with this. His presence and his truth is what is going to get you through your suffering. His presence, his nearness, his heart for us, 
His presence and his truth is what gets us through. That's why this, some little silly program that is void of his presence and his truth isn't going to get you through suffering. Some cheerleader mentality. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Come on, you know, just, it's not that bad. Tomorrow's going to be a brighter day. Listen, that's not going to get the job done. What gets the job done is his presence and his truth. That's how we get through this thing. And the good news is, in the midst of our getting rocked, like we do sometimes, his presence and his truth is there to get us to the other side. John the Baptist. Okay, well, let's start with John here today. Think about this. John the Baptist, nobody greater born according to Jesus. Nobody greater born among women than John the Baptist but then the kingdom of God shows up and he says, but he who's least in the kingdom is even greater than that. But I want you to know, while John the Baptist was alive, there was nobody greater born than him. He was faithful to the call of God on his life, so much so that he got arrested and imprisoned for publicly rebuking King Herod. I guess John didn't get the memo about separation of church and state. What I said was, I guess John didn't get the memo about the separation of church and state. And John thought it was his idea as a prophet of God, as a follower of Jesus, to be able to speak to the powers that be and say, thus saith the Lord. That's another sermon altogether. But John the Baptist, after all of his faithfulness, he gets so confused by his imprisonment and his suffering, he gets filled with doubt, and he sends word to Jesus with this question. Could you imagine this? John the Baptist sends messengers to Jesus to ask him, Matthew eleven three, are you the coming one or shall we look for another? This is John who said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But his suffering rocks him so much that he says with sarcastic bitterness and offense, dude, are you the one or not? What's he, what's, what's, that's such a loaded question. How can you be who you say you are and allow me to suffer like this? Don't raise your hand. You ever been there? Lord, where are you in this? What are you doing in this? Don't you see me in this? I've been faithful. In fact, my faithfulness to the call and the cause is what got me in this mess. Surely you're going to do something. Are you the one or not? From behold the Lamb of God who takes away to the sin of the world to are you the one or not? What's in the middle? Suffering. That's how radical suffering can rock you. The greatest guy that ever lived was so rocked by his suffering, it caused him to question Jesus himself. How does Jesus answer? Matthew 11, 4 through 6. Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who's not offended because of me. What does Jesus do for John? He brings him the truth because truth is the solution to our suffering. What does he tell him? I am the miracle working Messiah. I'm touching people all over the place. Now listen, just because I'm not doing for you what you think I should be doing for you doesn't mean I'm not who I am. John. Come on, man, get your eyes back on the truth. Just because you think I should be getting you out of prison right now, and I'm not, doesn't mean that I'm not the Messiah of the world. There's something else, there's something bigger going on here. And blessed are you 
when you're not offended because of me. Blessed are you when your faith doesn't get rocked to the point of quitting and giving up because you're so offended at what God isn't doing in your suffering. Jesus is telling John truthfully, you need to trust me. Oh, I knew there was a catch. John, you need to trust me. You need to trust me in this. What do I try to tell people when they're going through suffering? Two things I want you to trust. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. Trust that. Well, I don't feel him. I don't see him. He's not doing what I think. It's all right. The truth is, he's near to those who have a broken heart. Trust that whether you feel it or not. What else do I tell people to trust? Psalm 147, 3. He heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. In other words, he doesn't just come close to be close and go, yep, there you are. This is a problem. He gets near and then he begins to do the work of the great physician, which is to heal the brokenhearted and to bind up their wounds. This is what he, this is his presence in action. So he brings his truth, he brings his presence, he brings his touch, if you will, and that is what heals us in our suffering. We can never, ever, ever lose sight of that. God's presence and his truth is the solution for our suffering, period. Now, let's start the message this morning. George Barna, the great pollster for the last several decades, tells us that the single most asked question by believers and unbelievers alike is why is there so much suffering and evil in the world? It's the number one question asked by believers and unbelievers alike. Why is there suffering and evil in the world? There's others that will go beyond that and say, there's no way that there can be a loving God with so much evil and suffering in the world. Can't exist. You see a baby starving in Africa? There's no way a loving God can exist. Another school shooting? There's no way a loving God can exist. Now let's start to get philosophical as well as biblical. The interesting point about people's reaction to evil and suffering, the fact that people acknowledge evil and suffering proves, shows that we have an instilled knowledge of how things should be about what is right and what is good. And so when that which is wrong and that which is evil happens, we have an instilled knowledge to say, that's not right, that's not right. The question then is, where did the knowledge of right and good come from? Where did the knowledge of wrong and evil come from? I'm gonna tell you where it came from. A loving God who created the beauty and the perfection of the Garden of Eden and placed mankind in it, made in his own image, and God said, this is very good. And so from the very beginning of creation, Adam and Eve, our mother and father, there was an instilled knowledge. It is part of our human DNA as a result of being made in God's image and as a result of being the inhabitants of Eden's beauty and perfection. We know when something is wrong. We know when there's something that is evil and that's where it comes from. Beautiful, peaceful, heaven on earth was God's idea. And it was instilled in every single person. It has been instilled in every person. Again, that's why everything that isn't right and good 
bothers us as humans. So we go, okay, well, what happened? Mankind chose rebellion. How did they choose rebellion? They ate the forbidden fruit. They, eat, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, if you do it, you're going to die. Everything's going to die. Everything is going to become corrupted and corroding. They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And everything went wrong in their rebellion. Their sin resulted in a fallen humanity and in a cursed world. And so we have a cursed world that we live in now. There's floods and there's tornadoes and there's earthquakes and there's famines and there's pestilences. Because we live in a fallen world as a result of the fall of mankind. We have fallen mankind. Sinful, rebellious in our nature. And it inflicts evil and suffering on itself, on ourselves, and on others. It is a result of the fallen nature based on our rebellion from God. Well, then you go, well, what's the whole deal then with choice? You see, we start going down this path that the church has to start answering these questions for people. What's the deal with choice? Why would, they, why would God have given Adam and Eve the ability to choose? Why would, listen, why would God give people free will? We don't think about this. Free will, friends, is God's greatest gift to mankind. And free will is God's greatest gift to himself. God has given us the ability to choose right and wrong, good and bad, love and hate. God's given us that free will, that option. What God didn't do is make us perfectly programmed mechanical robots that perform perfectly all the time. Now, what happens when God gives mankind this free will? What happens as a result of it? He runs the risk of us choosing the wrong thing in our fallen nature. But he also runs the risk. Not runs the risk. He also gives the opportunity for free will to be expressed through genuine love and adoration for himself and one another. God was willing to risk genuine love even knowing that it could produce evil because genuine love is more valuable and powerful than evil. God had to give free will. It is the greatest gift to us. What gives us satisfaction when we do what's right and we choose to love and we choose to give and we choose to serve? We have satisfaction because we've been given choice. We're not just mechanical robots doing what we were programmed to do. So God had to give choice. And you ask the next question. Okay, well, God gave choice. All right, so here's what I think I would do if I was God. I think I'd just wipe out every evil person. Are you sure? Isn't it, isn't it funny how everybody else is evil? Why doesn't God just wipe out the evildoers? Because we'd all be wiped out at some point in our life. Has anybody here ever done, like me, something evil? So if God wiped out everybody who chose out of their own free will to do something evil, he would wipe out every single one of us. The book of Romans tells us in chapter 3, verse 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. <laughs> okay, I was just thinking out loud. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. You see, anyone who understands their own unrighteousness would never want God to destroy the wicked because they would be condemning themselves. And anyone who understands, listen to me, God's nature 
would never say that God destroy the wicked because what? 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us that God, thank God, God is patient and he doesn't want people to perish but that all should come to repentance, that all in their own free will would say, I was wrong and I need to be made right with God. God, I'm sorry, confess, repent and turn from my wicked ways. Choice, choice. Okay, well, I've got another question for you, Burger. I'll, all right, I'm, I'm tracking with you so far. Well, can't God just stop some of the evil and suffering? Okay, let's not wipe out every evil person. Let's give them the chance to repent. But can't God wipe out some of the evil and suffering? Beloved, listen to me. We have no idea what doesn't come our way. We have no idea what God has already stopped. The other question is, where does God draw the line to satisfy our opinion? If God doesn't, why doesn't God just stop some of the evil? Okay, well, where do you suggest we draw the line? Okay, I mean, this is absurd, right? But we have to state the absurd to make the point. Okay, Here, here's what's all right. It's all right if only five little girls get raped and abused by their father or their neighbor. That, that's okay, we can live with that. Well, ask those five little girls if that's an all right line to draw. Do you see what I'm saying? Where do we draw the line between what's right and what God should allow and shouldn't allow? Is a hundred soldiers being killed fighting for our freedom? Is, is that an acceptable line, but a thousand is too many? You ask the crying wives and the crying children if the hundred, if the hundred is an acceptable number. See, all brokenness, all sin, it's all too much. And we have no idea what God prevents from happening. We just see what does happen and we go, oh my gosh, God, just stop it all. Oh, that he would stop it all. And there's coming a day when he will. This is what causes us to look for a city whose builder and maker is God. Where there's no more crying and sorrow and tears or pain or suffering or sickness. Where there's no more rape and murder and school shootings and abortion. Where it's all gone forever. Well, why does God allow prolonged periods of suffering? This is an interesting one. The answer to that is, God's not only loving, but he's all-knowing. He's omniscient. So why would God allow prolonged suffering to happen? Because God knows the past the present and the future. And he's working things out for his own glory and we, yeah, have to trust that. Well, how are you expecting me to trust in that situation? Can I tell you something? Don't try to learn how to start trusting when you're in the situation. Learn to start trusting before you get in the situation. You're going to be able to learn to trust him in your suffering when you've previously gotten to know him before you started suffering. And so you go through prolonged suffering. That's why I'm not treating this lightly. Prolonged suffering. Hard, long, drawn out. God, where are Real question, real question. God, what have I done? Dark nights of the soul. How can you allow this to continue? God, how can you allow this to continue? I don't understand it, but I do trust you.
Church, God is looking for some people that he can trust with suffering. God said to the devil, Satan himself, have you considered my servant Job? God is making a statement about the faith, the integrity, and the trust of the man Job. Satan, have your way. I know he's going to trust me. I know he's going to trust me. And in the midst of his trust of me, other people for millennia are going to be able to see that it is possible to trust God in the worst of situations. He lost his children, every one of them. He lost his fortune, every penny. The only thing God left him with was a nagging wife. Who said to him, forsake your integrity, curse God, and die. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I got chicken skin. I wish you, could you see that? The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Don't say that lightly to people who are suffering. I don't, I, there, there is no, nothing trite or Christianese or shallow or surfacy about any of this. Suffering is real, painful, and can rock you to the core. But God is near and God will heal and God will preserve your faith and get you to the other side that will cause your own faith to grow and will be a witness to other people so that when they see their own suffering, they will see it through the lens of your faithful expression and God's faithful promise. I want to... Finish quickly with this story of Joseph. Because as much as your faith can be rocked, it doesn't have to be. Suffering doesn't have to rock your faith. Yeah, it can challenge, it can hurt, but you don't have to have that offended kind of sarcastic, bitter meltdown that John the Baptist had. Joseph, all the way back to the book of Genesis, all the way back to the beginning. Each one of these things, and many of us know it, but you, you got to try to put yourself in Joseph's head and in his heart for a minute. Joseph is sold by his jealous brothers into slavery. His brothers hated him so bad that they sold him to foreigners and into slavery. Does anybody think that might mess with a fellow a little bit? A child of promise, a child of destiny, being sold into slavery by his own brothers, carted off to a foreign land, separated from his father and his family. That by itself is a level of suffering I think none of us have, have experienced. It gets worse. He then gets falsely accused of rape. This, this is what's staggering to me. 
The scripture never says that Joseph complained at all. Never. Sold into slavery to foreigners by his brothers, accused of rape, thrown then into prison, and he serves faithfully without complaining, without getting bitter. There he is in prison. The attack of the enemy cannot overwhelm the providence or goodness of God, and he becomes head over all of the prisoners even. What happens next? He interprets a dream for a butcher or for a, a baker and a who? Cupbearer. Thank you, Cody. He interprets a dream for him, and the, the one that lives promises him and says, When I get out of here, I promise you. I'm going to tell Pharaoh about you. You're going to get out of this place. Guess what happened? Joseph gets forgotten. Serving, doing the right thing over and over and over again. And all he seems to get with little bits of light in between is a life of suffering. Doesn't lose his integrity, doesn't lose his trust, doesn't lose his faith, doesn't complain. Just keeps on keeping on, doing the right thing, knowing his God, understanding what God is up to. Well, he finally gets remembered. And to shorten the story, he gets raised to second in command of all of Egypt. He then is able to save his 70 member family from death and extinction. And they become the nation of Israel. God allowed, listen to this, y'all. God allowed Joseph's 13 years. 13 long, drawn out years. I had a bad week, and I'm not sure I believe in God anymore. <laughs> really? Thirteen years from being sold into slavery to being elevated to second in command. Thirteen years. Faithful, non-complaining, trusting. And what does he realize? God allowed the suffering, the prolonged suffering. God allowed it to produce a greater good, which is to not just preserve a family, but to birth a nation. You get to the end of the story. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. And God says, or God, Joseph says to his brothers who did this evil against him, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. God knew all the time that in the midst of this suffering, that looked like people were trying to afflict with evil to afflict with pain and suffering, that God was bigger than it all. What you jokers meant for evil for my life, God meant for good, to save and to keep many people alive. Why does God allow prolonged suffering? Why does God allow suffering? Because there's always a greater good on the end of it than we ever could have imagined. He knows past, present, and future. He knows what he's doing. Trust him, trust him, trust him. Job said, yea, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. The hardest verse in the Bible to believe, in my estimation, 
as Romans 8.28. God causes all things, not some things. God causes all things to work together for your good. For those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Do you love God? Are you called according to his purpose? Then God is the one who is at work causing all things to work together for the good. Nothing is lost. Your cancer condition is not lost on God. Whether he heals you here or heals you in heaven after he allows your faith to be sustained by his presence and truth, he's working it for the good. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. I'm not telling you as someone who's never been like John the Baptist, I've been like John the Baptist before. I've been to the point of pain and suffering where I question and I doubt and I'm bitter and I'm sarcastic and I'm filled with tears and I'm in the fetal position on my bed sobbing, oh God, what's happening? I've been there. I don't say this lightly. I'm not trying to put a Band-Aid on your wound. What I am here to say is trust him. Trust him. Because he makes all things work together for the good. And sometimes the all things is 13 years later. God doesn't have microwave embroidered for his name tag. He's not instant and he's not quick. He's seldom early but never late. Trust him. This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can do this thing, y'all. We can do it. We can do it. We just have to grow up a little bit. We can do it. Shall we pray together this morning? So, Father, for those that are here in the room and those that are watching, Lord, for those that could be even right now suffering pain, disappointment, disillusionment, physical, emotional, spiritual pain and suffering. Father, as the body of Christ, we join our faith and we join our prayers for the precious people around us that could be suffering today. We say, God, be near, bring your truth, and heal. Sustain, give grace. Lord, if you've called us to a time of prolonged suffering, would you give us the perseverance by the power of your Holy Spirit to suffer well and to be an example to those that are watching? Lord, if it would be in your plan, and we would sure love it, if your desire is to heal and to deliver, God, would you touch people around us with that? We look to you. We trust you. No matter what, we believe all things are working together for our good. We love you and we trust you this morning. In the matchless name of Jesus, who suffered that we might spend eternity with you. In Jesus' name. Amen, somebody. Glory to the God of heaven. We'll see y'all 7 a.m. tomorrow morning, Facebook and Instagram live for our 12-week devotional, 12 consecutive Mondays. 
Check it out. Come join us. We'll see you tomorrow morning. God bless and keep you in Jesus' name.